in my talk today, which is going to be on emotional design. So, hello. Get the kittens out of the way. It's the only kittens in the whole talk. Um, oh, I know, I've won you over, right? It, it, can, it can only get better from the kittens. Um, so, I'm Moral. Um, follow me on Twitter, please, because I'm vain. Um, and I am an interaction designer. Um, I'm also a developer, but I'm not going to talk about that today. So, I'm an interaction designer, and um, I want to take a moment to talk to you about what I feel that means, uh, especially the interaction bit. Uh, interaction involves a lot of different facets of design. So, it involves elements of graphic design, it involves elements of motion design, where uh, it's not static, but a linear progress, uh, and information architecture. But the key thing that separates interaction design from all of these other types of design is the interaction. And interaction is really hard. And, and to kind of understand why interaction is hard, uh, I think we have to look at you know, what it involves. Uh, especially, you know, starting with us interacting, human beings interacting with human beings. Uh, even though we're, we're both human, we can still have uh, misunderstandings, right? How many times have you been talking to someone and you're not really sure whether they love you or they hate you, you just met them, right? Um, and this is face to face where we have all these visual cues to understand one another. So what if we're on the phone? So you separate uh, the people and, and, and uh, suddenly you've lost all these visual cues and the ability to misunderstand each other gets amplified. Okay, so let's remove the audio, let's remove the voice, which has a lot of meaning, carries emotion, etc. When you're emailing each other, how many people have had uh, a misunderstanding over email? Where you thought somebody just hated you, exactly, nearly everyone in the room, right? You're still communicating with a human being, we should know each other really well, right? You're a human, I'm human, hi, we should be able to communicate. And yet, when we remove the visual cues, when we remove the, the oral cues, suddenly the ability to misunderstand each other and not be able to communicate, it, it, it just gets amplified. Now, to understand how difficult it is to do interaction design, to actually script these things, remove one of the human beings completely from the equation, and try to talk, try to create a scripted uh, experience that talks to a human being, and, and you, you might start to get an idea about how difficult it is, what we're trying to do. Um, so, and that was that slide that didn't go on. Um, and in order to do it properly, we need focus. You need focus, an almost dictatorial focus on user experience. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk to you about today. But uh, a little bit of historic context, it wasn't always like this. So in the early days of computing, computers allowed us to do things that we couldn't do at all. So a mainframe computer, no matter how difficult it was to use, made things that were impossible possible. And that was okay. So that was, that was the value. And this is what I call the age of features. But things have changed since then. The costs of computers, of hardware, of software have plummeted since those days. And these have become basically, both of them, hardware and software, have become commodities. And like commodities, they have a set price. Uh, in our industry, the price is very close to free, if not free, for, for these. So, um, as with coffee, though, for certain things, for certain types of coffee, we're willing to pay an extra amount. Like, what, what, what are we paying for? And the same thing is true, for example, for mobile phones, a better analogy. So, mobile phones are a commodity, right? In this country, at least, we get them free with our plans for the most part. Why do we pay extra for a certain mobile phone? Same thing with MP3 players. An MP3 player actually costs maybe $10 or 10 pounds uh, at most. Why do we pay over 100 for a certain MP3 player? And how did the same company do the same thing with a computer? So, I don't know about you guys, but I think they're onto something. <laughs> but what differentiates them? What makes them different from the other guy? <laughs> In other words, what is the differentiating factor in a commoditized industry? And the differentiating factor is user experience. So, a little takeaway quote, when infrastructure is commoditized, the differentiating factor becomes user experience. So, great, all we need to do is create great user experiences, and that's it, right? Um, it's, maybe slow down. Uh, before even defining what a great user experience is, maybe we can try to define what a bad user experience is. So, who's had a bad user experience here? 
Right, how has it made you feel? I know how it makes me feel. It, it evokes an emotional response. I get angry, I get frustrated. So, at the very least, we should be building user experiences that don't infuriate the user and drive the user insane. And unfortunately, this is mostly the norm in our industry, right? Um, if you look at statistics for uh, IT projects and failure, etc., you get really high stats, 60, 70 percent failure rates, where users are rejecting applications that are made. Um, and it bo mostly boils down to user experience, because remember, it's really hard to do. Um, but it is easy to get to, well, not easy if you have focus, it's easy to get to the point where you're not infuriating the user. And the one rule of thumb, really, is to worry about the right thing. And the thing to worry about is the user's needs, not your needs. So this is a room full of developers, primarily, right? Developers, put your hands up. Okay, primarily a room full of developers. So developers, if the first thing you're doing is deciding on your database structure when you start on an application, you're worrying about the wrong thing. You're worrying about your problems. You're trying to make your life easier. You're trying to get this beautiful, normalized table structure that you can take home and, and print out and put on your wall and go, I did that, it was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. Um, no, you're worrying about your problems. What you should be worrying about is the user from the very beginning. And that will create more problems for you. But that's OK. That's how it should be. It requires focus. It requires focus on user experience, on usability, and not just from the one interaction designer or one usability expert that's on the team, but everyone on the team has to be focused on usability in order to get to that very basic spot of not driving users insane. And it's about quality over quantity. It's not about having 5,000 features, you know, 4,000 of which don't work properly, or 4,999 of which don't work properly. It's about having three that do. The quote that I love about this is by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, the author of The Little Prince. And he says, perfection is achieved not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. So um, keep that in your little finger as you're, as you're designing things, as you're developing things. It's not about features anymore. Um, so OK, we've gotten to the point where we're not driving users insane, where we're not infuriating them. That's great. We call this in our industry usable. But as Aaron was saying, and I love this analogy, so I stole it from him with permission, um, usable is equal to edible. So you don't go out to a restaurant and say, uh, darling, I would like to go out tonight and have a lovely edible meal. No. You say, I want to go out and have a pleasurable, beautiful meal. I want to experience it. So as Aaron was showing, the hierarchy of needs, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we can apply this to what we're doing. So, whereas edible is good, and who was in Aaron's session? Were you all in Aaron's session? Awesome. So, whereas edible is good, we can go beyond edible <laughs> to pleasurable. And it doesn't always mean bigger is better, by the way. Um, we can go beyond edible to beautiful and add beauty to what we're building. In fact, we can go beyond it and add delight to the things that we're building. And maybe, I know I hate Apple for killing this word for me with their iPad ads, but maybe we can even go beyond it and make experiences that are truly magical. But if we do, let's not make ads about it where we're kind of cringeworthy and we're like, it's so magical. Um, and that brings us, really, to the art of user experience. And the question you might ask is, well, Aral, um, is user experience an art? Um, is it an art? And, uh, well, I don't know. I don't know. When you think of any new technology that comes out, uh, it's usually misunderstood. So this is actually a real sign. When the electric light was invented, uh, and it says you can't read it, do not attempt to light with a match. So uh, a better analogy, probably, is when the Lumiere brothers showed the first film of a train arriving at the station. Um, and the story goes, that everyone in the cinema uh, just ran out because they thought there was a real train coming at them uh, into, the, into the cinema because they hadn't seen it before, they hadn't seen a film. Uh, this was either true or really good marketing by the Lumiere brothers for the reality of their films, the realism. Um, but what, uh, what matters is that that was 100 years ago and since then we've learned to read the medium of film. 
When it first came out, we thought photography was objective. People thought you could, you could place a camera and you caught and you captured objective reality. That's what people thought the camera did. That's what people thought a movie camera did. Now we know better. We understand it's purely subjective, depending on where you aim the camera, depending on what you leave out of the frame, what you put in the frame, depending on how you edit it afterwards. It's purely, purely subjective. And now that we've realized that, we've realized that there's an artistry behind it. And we applaud the artistry. So when I say to you, Woody Allen, you think, OK, well, there's a director, there's an auteur, there's, a, there's an artist. Uh, if I say Jonathan I for product design, we're starting to see the same things. We're starting to see a signature. You know the kind of products Johnny Ive creates. He has a signature. He, ha he is an auteur. Um, so what about interaction design? Well, who are the artists? Who are the, the, the auteurs of interaction design? Well, I'm assuming it's going to be you guys you know, sitting in this room today. It's us. Uh, so I think it is an art. And uh, talking about the art of user experience, well, actually, user experience as a term. Two parts, user and experience. I want you to think about, in a typical day, how long you spend interacting with scripted experiences, with experiences that might involve a mobile phone, a screen of some sort. Uh, how, how big a portion of your day does that take up? And I know we're geeks, but think about like the regular person on the street who happens to have an iPhone, who happens to buy a ticket from a kiosk as they're uh, going into the uh, underground, um, who happens to go home and then TiVo something, or, or watch television, or interact with interactive television. How much of our days have we begun to spend interacting, not with humans, but with the creations that humans have created? Um, so when you look at user experience, I think user is redundant at this point. We're really talking about experience design, because the stuff that we're designing, the things that we're creating, are impacting people's lives at such, at such a, a proportion that we're actually impacting the quality of life of people who are using our products, right? People are using our products throughout a, a great portion of their day. So if they're having bad user experiences, they're actually having bad life experiences. If, if they're getting frustrated for three, four hours in a day because of something that you've built, then that's impacting the quality of their life. So I, I'd rather talk about experience design. And user interface is not the experience. It's not just the user interface. Uh, we can't separate software and hardware. We used to, right? What do you do? I'm an interaction designer. I worry about what goes on in the screen. That is no longer valid. So this is, this is the old way of thinking. Well, hardware, it was all about specs, right? You still see this. You get a Samsung phone, and the advertising is, it's got 50 processors in there, and it's like a gazillion gigahertz, and, and it has five mega teraflops of whatever. And, and that's, their, that's their advertising. Is it fun? Is it great? No, it sucks. It's horrible, but it's damn fast. You know, it's, 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 it, and, and that's, that's the old way of thinking. So software, oh my gosh, CS5, 8,000 new features that you won't even find. Like, where are they? Which menu structure? Um, this used to be the way to think about things. Today, it's about software and hardware together. What we do as interaction designers has so much more in common with product design than it does with, say, graphic design, although it includes elements of it. Um, so it's about software and hardware together. It's about the experience. So the age of features that I was talking about earlier uh, with the mainframe computers making things that were impossible possible, that actually is dead today. So let's talk about the art of experience design. And I'm going to need you to give me a, a time call when I have 10 minutes left because my counter isn't working properly. Um, so let's talk about the art of experience design. It's about the little things. So for example, my first iPhone app, Avid, um, it let you scan a book and uh, it, a barcode from the book. And if, you have, and if they had it on Safari Books Online, you could, uh, you could start reading the book right away. So this is it in uh, action. There's a barcode. There's a little blobby guy there, opens his eyes, says, ah, oh, in just a few seconds, all will be revealed. And then it finds it, and there you go. There's CSS Mastery. And then you can just tap Read It Now. And the book would open up, and you can start reading CSS Mastery. So um, that's great. 
When I show people the apps that I build, usually the questions that I get, especially from other developers, is how? How did you do it? How did you do the barcode recognition? How did you do this? The questions that really interest me, however, are why? Why did you do it the way that you did it? Because I could have built Avid a hundred different ways. Uh, why did I build it the way that I built it? Why are there little emoji blobs inside this application? Why are they there? Um, they're delighters. So those little emoji blobs are delighters. Um, if, you, if you think about it, uh, just, just close your eyes, actually. Close your eyes for a second, all of you. Go for it. Close your eyes. It's okay. Don't fall asleep there. Um, and think about the last time you felt pleasure, like childlike pleasure, okay? Just close your eyes and think about that time. And remember that feeling. It's a good feeling, right? Childlike pleasure. It's just an innocent, childlike pleasure. Okay, hold that thought. For how many of you was this some sort of an interactive experience? A game, a website, something that you saw? All right, there are a couple of... Everyone else, just sex? That was... Right. Okay. All right, okay. Um, <laughs> It was. I'm right. Damn. Okay. <laughs> All right. So for the four true geeks in the, in the room, great. I'm really glad. <laughs> what kind of site was it? No. Uh, <laughs> it might just all be. All right. <laughs> but um, I, I don't know if it was Aaron or someone was showing this. Uh, this is my favorite example of a delighter. This is uh, Paul Annette's uh, creation, a little uh, holding page for the silverback uh, product when it, when it was first uh, announced. And if you see, um, when you resize the browser, there's parallax scrolling happening with CSS3. Who hasn't seen this before? Okay, like three people. All right, everyone else has seen this. This is really famous. Um, but the cool thing about this is, it's not a flash intro, right? The site has a purpose. And the purpose is, it needs to tell you that Silverback will be released, when will it be released, what can you do to get, keep updated, etc. It does all of that right there. So it, the opposite of this would be you know, a big flash intro going, right, in the next five minutes, we're going to, at some point, reveal to you what this site is really about right after you watch this animating ball and listen to this crappy music. Um, that's, that's not doing what it should be doing. So it does what it should do. And then it has a hidden level of delight. And I mean, who resizes their browser on a regular basis here when they go on a new site? This always scares me. Is every time you go on a new site? Really? Wow. OK, I don't. But uh, apparently there are people who do. But the majority of you don't. So Paul knew this when he designed it. He knew that not everyone would be resizing it or find this. But he also knew that there would be someone, like the four people who put their hands up here, who would. And one of them, maybe, would notice what was happening. You know, they'd be going, and then, and then they'd kind of go, ooh, <laughs> ah. But, here's the thing, then they'd go on Twitter, and they'd be like, Oh my fucking god, it's Alex rolling in CSS Nation, oh my god! Pink ponies! And then, and then send it, right? And then suddenly all their friends would be going, Ooh, ah! And then suddenly it blows up, which is what happened with the site. An even better example, even simpler example, is an email. So who's got Moo cards here? Who bought Moo cards? Okay, so when you order Moo cards, you get an email. But you don't get an email from, do not reply at Microsoft.com. I've gotten those as well. You get an email from Little Moo. It's Little Moo. And he says, he says I'm Little Moo, the, the bit of software that will be managing your order with us. And suddenly you're like, oh, hi, Little Moo. How are you? I hope you're having a good day. But you keep reading, and it's like, I will shortly be sent to Big Moo. Our print machine, and we'll print it for you in the next day. And you're like, Little Moo's not alone. <laughs> Little Moo's got a friend. <laughs> oh, and and if, even if something goes wrong, and Moo are awesome, you know, nothing's ever gone wrong with my order, but even if something does, at this point, you know, if you're like, oh, what, what, what happened to your Moo order? They, they, they must be wankers. What are you talking about? It's Little Moo. <laughs> Don't talk that way about Little Moo. I love him. They've created an emotional relationship with me in an email. So when you're building your own products, when you're building your own applications, ask not, does it get the job done? Ask, does it give me joy to use? Another phrase that maybe we should be thinking about, another concept, so that was pleasure, another concept, empathy. 
So, so often we don't talk in these, using these words, these concepts when we're thinking about applications when we're building, right? These are very human concepts. Empathy. So, when things go right in an application, life is good, right? Um, it's when things go wrong sometimes, how we handle that, that's important. So, an example from Avid. So what happens if I'm scanning the barcode and uh, the internet is slow? So it goes, in just a few seconds, all will be revealed. But then the internet is slow, so it's not revealed. So he goes, hmm, it's taking a little longer than usual. Okay, so something might be wrong. And then if it keeps going, oh man, this isn't making me look good. <laughs> so, and then finally, like if it's still taking too long, it's like, starts crying. Like, please load, please. You can, you can imagine at this point, the user's kind of going, please load, come on. Um, and then finally, it goes, the internet hates us and, and, and says, okay, I couldn't load this, and it times out. So what is the, in, the, the accepted, perhaps naive implementation of this that you see in applications everywhere? It's the indeterminate scroll bar, uh, sorry, the progress bar, right? So you have this beautiful progress bar uh, that you can very easily put into your apps, right? And so what, the, what that's saying to the user is, it doesn't have text around it, but what that's saying is, all right, I'll get you something right away. Look, wow, I'm snazzy, I'm beautiful. I'm going to get you something. That's what I'm doing. But then it's not your application's fault if the internet is slow. Um, if your connection is slow, I mean, not the internet as a whole, of course, um, which I downloaded last week. Um, <laughs> if, if, if your internet connection is slow, um, it doesn't react to that change in circumstances, right? It still keeps going, like, I'm doing something for you. I'm going to get that for you right away. Yeah, uh -huh. yep, you're going to, yep, okay, great, yeah. And, and, and as the amount of time grows, you're getting increasingly frustrated, and it's just mocking you. It's like, yeah, yeah, it'll be with you. Yeah, <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, and you're like, I hate you, as opposed to trying to empathize with the user saying, okay, I kind of understand what you're going through right now. It's not in my control either, but I understand what you're going through. Empathy. This does not mean build Clippy. <laughs> okay? Where do we draw the line? What, why is Clippy Clippy, and why is my little emoji blob what it is? We put our own characters into what we're building. Like it or not, we're crafting these experiences, and these experiences will reflect your character. So, I was talking about the auteur theory. It will have your signature. It will have your character. Whose character is Clippy? It's Microsoft, right? When I look at Clippy, I see Steve Ballmer in paperclip form, sitting on my toolbar, kind of going, <laughs> yeah, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Come on, let's do something. Um, and, and, and the little emoji blob guy is kind of me, and I'm like this. So, uh, think about what character you're imbuing your applications with when you're building them. So it's about the little things. My latest app, Feathers, uh, which lets you decorate tweets, which I, I kind of feel wrong because it's been talked about in two sessions and I'm just really glad it, is, it has been. But uh, what it lets you do is it lets you take you know, regular tweets and, and instead create ones that have uh, symbols and different text styles, etc. So sorry to all you semantic web people in here. I, yeah. Um, but you can, you can tweet in different text styles and you can have different symbols. And uh, here we go. What else does it do? That's about it. And you can do Unicode art, etc. So it's, it's, not, it's not an app that cures cancer or anything. Uh, it's just meant to add a little bit of fun to something uh, that, that we do on a daily basis. So there we go, having lunch. And uh, you can post into Facebook, etc. So um, again, it's not the how or what it does, but the whys that matters to me. The, de the details of how things work. So in Feathers, for example, um, something as mundane as the login was a huge issue for me. Because if you care about user experience, little things can become huge problems. Why? Why was it an issue? When I started building it, I wanted to have it be so simple that people could enter their username and password, and then it would flip over, and you'd get started right away with the application. But there was a problem with that. Twitter did not want you to do that. They did not want you to capture the user's username and password. Uh, they want you to use OAuth. OAuth is great for the web. I think everyone should be using it for the web. But OAuth, as it stood back then, did, did not make sense for mobile or desktop applications in terms of user experience. Because here's the experience with OAuth, with my app. So remember, the alternative is you enter your username and password, and then it flips over, and you're up and running. 
here's the OAuth experience. Welcome to my app, and then now please go away. All right, welcome to my app, and now go away. And where, where are we sending them to? We were sending them to this page. So think about all the effort you put into your own app to make it beautiful and wonderful, and then you're sending them here. So at the time, what I said uh, on, the, on the mailing list for the developers was sending a user to Twitter's mobile OAuth page after having slaved over every pixel in your iPhone app is like giving someone a ride in a Ferrari and then throwing them out in the mud and then pulling them back in for the rest of the trip. And the rest of the trip is not going to be as enjoyable. Um, it's a radical context change. And they, they did change the OAuth landing page, so it's a little better now. But remember, this was an issue. The moment someone comes into your app, it's very important. It's the hello. So imagine if I'm meeting you for the first time, and I say, oh, hi, can you just go away now? Thank you. Um, but the problem was they said, no OAuth, no source parameter. So on your tweets, you know it says via Tweety or via Feathers or via whatever uh, other client you're using. Back then, they said, well, if you don't use OAuth, we won't give you the via bit. It'll say via web. So that's an uh, amazing uh, bit of organic marketing, especially for an app that lets you create tweets that are visually distinguished. Um, and that was the point where I had to make a decision. Did I care about my needs or my users' needs? Would I take a hit in this organic marketing in order to create a better user experience for my users? And I took the hit. I said, OK, I'm going to use basic authentication. I'm not going to use OAuth. And it's all right. I know this is going to hurt my app. And when Stephen Fry uh, tweeted, my life is going around in circles, um, 1,365,217 people did not see that he used my app to do it because of this. And that's OK, because um, people started talking about it. And they were like, oh, what did you use that for? Oh, we used it for this. Um, but the key thing here is, if you worry about UX, if you're focused on UX, you may have to make sacrifices elsewhere, and it pays off. So I call what we do manufacturing fun. And here's an example. So when you're typing, the little bird fills up. It's a little bit of fun. It's not just a character count. If you get to the top, you actually do get the numbers come up. So at the point where it kind of matters that you're precise, it does give you the numbers. But where it doesn't, it just says, OK, well, here you go. You're typing, and little bird's filling up. Um, same thing when you uh, actually send a tweet. Little bird kind of flaps its wings. And it goes, yay, OK, we're sending a tweet. Little tiny things. Um, and also, the amount of time that I spent on trying to get the keyboard to work exactly like iPhone apps. If you've, had, if you've played with iPhone apps that have custom keyboards, they usually don't work exactly, unless people have taken a lot of effort uh, like an iPhone, uh, like the iPhone's original keyboard does. So little tiny things, but, and this is important, it pays off. It really does pay off. All those hours you spend slaving over the partial transparency of the fringe pixels on that bird just to make sure it looks perfect pays off. Um, these are some of the App Store reviews, and these are the ones that some of my favorite because they say joyful, fun, fell in love with, adorable. It's just an app that lets you decorate tweets, right? But it's more than that for someone. For someone, it made them smile. And that's the best reward you can get. It's not the money, it's not anything else. It's, you know that you improved someone's day with what you've done. And I think that is amazing. That is just amazing. Getting this sort of feedback, it just fills you up with the kind of, kind of joy and passion to build the next thing, to kind of go on with what you're doing, because you know that you're making someone's life better. And you know, not curing cancer, but adding a little bit of joy to people's lives. Uh, there's a, a comment here, I really love the singing bird where you send a tweet, it's fun all of a sudden. I mean, I love that. Uh, this is Aaron's quote, uh, he's very kind and uh, means a lot to me. Um, and this is the one that Aaron uh, showed in his, in his talk as well. Sometimes I make two long feather tweets just to watch the, turn, the bird turn red. So if people start playing with your applications in ways that you didn't even want, like think that they would, how cool is that? You know, they just want to see the bird turn red. They're not going to tweet it. It's, it's awesome. Uh, this is one of my favorites. I can't believe you took something as serious as Twitter and did this downloading now. Yay. You know, it's that sense of fun. Because when I released it, I got, I got the two people on the internet who were like, well, you know, it's just, just going to ruin the, the Twitter flow, the, the, the flow, the semantics, the whatever. I'm just like, lighten up. It's cool. It's all right. You know, it's, it's just, it's a little bit of fun. Um, and it got noticed. You know, it got noticed for the UI. It got featured by Apple as new and note, noteworthy in the US. Um, and you, know, you can find out more about it at Feathers app uh, and watch the video. Um, but 
I do want to end on a danger note.、Uh, two UX-related warnings. So, the first one, and this is important and mostly overlooked: beware of the weakest link. And by the weakest link, I mean that part of your experience that's not under your control, because your whole experience will be only as good as the weakest link. And the weakest link is the part that's not under your control. So,、um, if you have a part of your app, it could be the hardware, it could be the software that's not under your control. That will probably end up being the weakest link in the whole overall holistic experience.、Um, so, don't reinvent the wheel, but beware of using third-party libraries and components. I know this goes against the grain of what people usually talk about, right?、Um, and APIs. And APIs. So this is this this is like totally against the grain of the Web 2.0 love fest of open data and APIs, right? Because we love them. It's great. It's all open. Well, what happens if you don't have control over, say, an API that you're using?、Uh, a great example is what happened to me last week.、Uh, Feathers for Facebook,、uh, as the app used to be called,、uh, now called Feathers Visage,、uh, was featured on the Austrian. And German app stores last week, and as you can see on the site, there's an apology and explanation for last week's Facebook outage.、Uh, of course, Facebook didn't、uh, disappear; they just turned off the app because it was called Feathers for Facebook, and they saw for Facebook as a trademark infringement. But the way they did it, and it was featured、um, on the app, is they just pulled the plug. So they turned it off from their end, and without letting me know. So of course this meant that I got I start getting one star reviews. Won't even post to Facebook. Waste of money. So it, the opposite of what I was telling you about all these beautiful reviews is when something goes wrong and it's not in your control, then that really starts to hurt.、Um, and so I wrote to Facebook and they said we never heard back from you after our initial email to you. Okay, Gmail really doesn't lose my mail that often, but let's say it happened.、Um, We're writing to inform you of a temporary restriction placed on Feather's stream due to policy issues on the Facebook platform. So you can kind of see where that's wrong. That's like it's backwards, right? We've just disabled your application because of a trademark infringement、uh, that we think there is, and so that was、uh, what they were alleging was the, the the trademark infringement. Fine, okay. Let's say they were right.、Um, we placed the restriction to protect the user experience on the platform. So this brings me to two things. Um, two things here.、Uh, first of all, these are all the apps that have like Facebook in the name on the App Store. That's fine. Let's say it's、uh, it's still their policy, so all these apps are going away. You should never disable an app without reasonable notice to a developer if you have an API, unless you absolutely have to, unless it's spam, unless it's malware. That's fine.、Um, but if you're going to, don't use user experience as an excuse. Because we've seen this with Apple as well. Apple has, on occasion, used user experience as an excuse for behaving like a dick, right? If you're going to behave like a dick, say I'm behaving like a dick because I can,、um, but don't use UX because that hurts UX. That hurts the movement that we have and the focus that we have on UX.、Um, and actually, the good thing that came out of it, though, is we now have a dev rights movement as of last week,、um, with、uh, that a lot of API providers are signing up for now.、Um, There's a lot of interest from Yahoo, the Zappos API guys, etc.,、um, and a lot of developers are signing up for it.、Uh, and the idea is to get a bill of rights for developers. A very, very simple document, maybe five points, right? That says, just you know, don't be dicks. <laughs> We're investing our time to work on to work、uh, with these APIs. Just treat us with a little bit of respect, right? And that actually will impact the user experience.、Um, And we're going to get a certification, an image mark, like a developer-friendly mark. That if you see that on an API,、uh, you'll be able to go, okay, well, this is developer-friendly. I can invest some time in this, and hopefully some labeling for APIs, like Creative Commons-style licenses with with nice, plain, clear icons that tell you what your API limits are, whether you can use them for commercial use or not, etc. So it's very, very early days.、Um, there's a Google group right now. There will be a website hopefully this week when I get back from this conference. But that's the Google group. Uh, there are representatives from Yahoo on there, from Zappos, from a couple of other smaller API providers, and lots of developers.、Uh, so come and join the conversation if you're interested in this.、Uh, but we're going to set this up, and hopefully we'll create a very easy way for you to kind of separate APIs that are developer friendly, that hopefully won't have a negative impact on your user experience, like the Facebook incident last week with Feathers for fe Feathers Visage.、Uh, visage.、Um, and uh, so hopefully this will be a positive influence、uh, for the whole. Ecosystem really, because like I was saying, 
the bit of your app that will bite you is the bit you don't have under control. This is, this is also what explains why Apple is doing so well. They have control over everything. So there's nothing they cannot fix if there's a problem with the experience. There's nothing they can't tweak. There's nothing they can't iterate over. So in summary, we've come a very long way since the early days of computing when computers actually allowed us to do things that we couldn't do in the past. So it didn't matter how difficult it was that uh, the, the process that we did them in, um, to uh, living in an industry where everything is commoditized and where the differentiating factor is user experience. We all know that we don't want to build user experiences that drive people crazy, and that's okay, and it's, it's, it's difficult because we're building experiences that talk, that where, where computers are talking to human beings. But we know that if we focus on the right thing, which is the user's problems, not yours, you'll get to that point with testing, etc., where you build a usable application. And that's fine. That's much better than what's out there for most applications. But we can go beyond that. We can go beyond usable and edible to layer pleasure on top of the interfaces and the experiences that we're building. And that brings us to the art of user experience, where we can build things that are not just usable, but beautiful. And we can build things that are not just usable, but pleasurable. And maybe we can create things that make people's lives and their experiences magical. Thank you.